Hey everybody, how's it going? It's been a long day. Thanks for everyone who showed up in the chat. We had 200 people waiting for the start bell to hit. Bam! We're here. Uh, yeah, we're talking about fish food today. So, this is a topic that highly debatable, blah, 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 like, I don't care what the internet says. You guys are here for my opinion and what I believe, and that's where we're gonna we're gonna start. Uh, so my opinion, I'm gonna quantify by I've been selling fish food for over 10 years now. It's so not just like feeding it to fish, but actually selling it. And so what I mean by that is when you have to sell something, you actually have to read a package, you have to know a bit about it, you have to be able to talk about it, you have to be able to do all these things, right? And you get a lot of reps coming through the stores year after year after year after year saying they've got the best. We've now made a better food. It's now even better. We've now got probiotics. We now have these things, right? And so it gets old real quick, right? And then you've got brands that have been around forever and they're innovating. Everyone's innovating. Everyone's making a new thing. And what we I feel like is... You know, like in human food, we've pretty much had human food on lockdown for the last all of my life, right? So I'm 36. For the last 36 years, food, nutrition, for the most part, um, you know, been relatively the same, whether, you know, it's the fad of the week or the year or the, the decade of like broccoli cures cancer, turns out broccoli causes cancer, turns out broccoli does this, whatever, right? But for the most part, we know eat relatively healthier things, eat a variety of things, you know, don't limit yourself to only eating one thing, and your body will be better for it. And we pretty much know that about uh, fish as well. Fish in the wild, they don't eat one specific thing. They're opportunistic eaters for the most part. Even the ones with highly specialized diet, like a Trophius cichlid out of Lake Tanganyika, uh, even though it eats mostly algae, there's lots of crustaceans and things that live in that algae. And being opportunistic, they'll eat their own fry, they'll eat other fry, that kind of stuff. So they're still getting protein even though they're an herbivore is what we classify them as. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I want to get out of the way there is that this is all opinion based. So where do I want to start with? You know, usually I start with ingredients and that kind of stuff. I'm going to start with what do I think is a good food? So when a rep comes into the store, so usually rep rides in from out of town on their horse, you know, and they've got a satchel full of foods that they're trying to pitch to a store to bring in because it's the latest and greatest and here's why. The first thing I always want to see is feeding fish that have never seen it before. Um, you know, so I might try and feed some discus. I might try and feed some guppies. I might try and feed some tetras and just kind of sprinkle around the store and see, do the fish eat it, right? That's like the first test because in my opinion, if a fish won't eat it, it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter what it's made out of, right? So if you give me the best food absolutely possible on the planet, but I never eat it, it's actually not good for me, right? I still die. So the, my first test and people will always battle me that on the internet is will the fish eat it that and how palatable is it that's my number one ask is do the fish like it will they eat it will they adapt to it all of that right new member welcome uh so that's number one number two for me is what does it do once it's in the water and there's a few things fish food does does it float does it sink does it sink slowly does it sink quickly does it make a mess, right? Does it slough off a bunch of stuff? Does it dye the water? Does it balloon up really big? Does it, uh, are the fish eating it, but then spitting it back out and turning it into a billion pieces? Like what is going on? Or with like an O-nip tab, you stick to the front and it slowly dissolves. Like what is the mode of delivery? How dirty is it gonna make my tank? Uh, is it releasing a bunch of stuff? And I run into a lot of differences uh, in foods because different manufacturers or different fish food companies are interested in different things. Some want it to be your tank will run the cleanest. Some will be we want your fish to look the brightest and most colorful. 
Some will be, we want it to be the most palatable. Some want to be a cheaper fish food. Some want to be a more expensive fish food. There's all these little vying factors for what this manufacturer is going to do, right? And so, you know, a good example for many, many years in the hobby and even still, uh, New Life Spectrum was considered a, a great food and it, you know, nutrition wise is perfectly fine, like most fish foods are. Uh, but what I personally didn't like about it was I felt there was a little bit extra dust when you feed it, like if they could uh, refine that process and not have as many fines come off while feeding. And then when it came out of the fish, so when the fish pooped it out, that was another non-desirable effect for me. Uh, Basically, it would always come out as like dust. It'd be very messy. So it didn't hold together after a fish had eaten it. Now, I'm sure there's scientists and stuff like that would say like, oh, that's because their body utilized more than a normal fish food or whatever you want to say. That being said, that leads to much, much cloudier water. And as a hobbyist, I don't want that, especially if I can take food A and food B and if they're relatively similar nutrition-wise and one is making my water more cloudy and one isn't, it kind of becomes a no-brainer for me. Uh, so that's what I didn't like about, let's say, New Life Spectrum food. Now, I really did like their Thera A pellet with the extra garlic. It really made fish go for it. I don't think it necessarily was great for warding away ick or anything like that, but I'm not sure it hurt either. But it did have a real strong smell, and yeah, I can get behind that. But price point's crazy. Then you enter in like Northfin Fish Foods. There, I would say Northfin Fish Foods right now is the most hyped fish food. And what I, I won't say the best fish food because it is a great food. All the foods I'm pretty much going to talk about today are good foods. But I don't believe there's any one best one. But it's got the internet hype behind it. Cichlid people love it. The internet in general loves it. And usually what happens is if you take a product... And this is what Aquarium Co-op does. You take a product where the fish likes it, the human likes it, and the pricing comes in right, you get a buzz about a product. And that's what Northfin's got going on. They've got a fish food that is edible. They've got relatively good ingredients. Uh, they've got good marketing behind it because the internet is behind them at the moment and kind of propelling them. Uh, but what I don't like, for me personally, with Northfin North fin fish food, is the sinking aspect. I'm not a huge fast sinking pellet guy. I, I really like floating food or uh, slow, uh, slow sinking foods, I guess. And so that's naturally what I like because of the community fish and stuff I do. And even with my African cichlid tanks, um, feeding North Fin fish food, it kind of falls into the gravel where, and this is I don't even want to mention the food name because people are going to be like, here he goes, pitching this food again. But given a choice, I would rather feed Vibrabites to my Pseudotrophia Solosi. They, they float for a little bit, then they sink slowly. Almost none make it to the ground, and they're, they like to eat them. Now, here's how I can tell you that I honestly like to have Vibrabites in my arsenal Hikari in general has been around forever and a day for a fish food manufacturer and I have like the worst margin like they don't there's not it's not super profitable to be selling Hikari fish foods because PetSmart, Walmart, all these places sell them and there's like no wiggle room and so I carry it off of the fact that I've used them for you know probably close to 15 years now not obviously Vibrabites that's a new thing but their foods in general and there's only ever been one food, I think, from Hikari that I was seriously disappointed in. Um, everything else has been good, whereas, like, wow, that performs exactly like I like it. And the one food I was disappointed with was the Seaweed Extreme, I think they called it. And it was meant for salt water, but what I didn't like is it really uh, fell apart in the water quite quick. Um, so in that that's one that I, I wouldn't even carry in my store. Like, I was like, ah, oh, geez, like, that's not... That's not a good thing. But, you know, for the most part, if you were to look at the thumbnail picture of this, you would see that there was Sarah Foods, there's Northfin Foods, there's Hikari Foods, there's San Francisco Bay, there's Rapashi, there's Fluval Foods. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's more as well. But, even, like, why is a store... So, I guess that's 
typically I'm very picky, right? When you go and you shop our online store, you see very few selections. Normally I pick the one best and I only sell that. You know, so like with lights, we have two types, right? With scissors, we have one type. With fertilizer, we have one type. With, you know, I try to select the best. And with foods, you get into that category and you go, wait a second. There's like a hundred different foods. And that's because variety, I do believe, is best. And the biggest thing I think that people don't account for is specific foods are meant for specific fish. And most often, we don't pair them correctly. That, I think, is the biggest problem we have going today. So after we look at will the fish eat it, after we look at what does it do in the water, the next thing I personally look at is what delivery method is this? Is it a flake food? Is it a nano pellet? Is it a one millimeter pellet? Is it a two millimeter pellet? Does it float? Does it sink? Is it soft? Is it hard? All these things matter into how a fish will eat it. So on average, people would treat a fish, you know, of course, when I go to point in my tank, there's not, not a single fish showing because they're behind my head and right here in the corner. Look at that, get over there. Um, but fish that are this big, most people would feed them a two, three, four millimeter pellet. And I personally feed like a one millimeter pellet. What I think people forget is that even though as a human, right, I'm 5'10", and I've got a mouth that's big, right, I've got a big mouth, that doesn't mean I want to eat giant things. It means I want bite size is what I want, and the fish want the same thing. And so if we have a hard pellet, and we're trying, to, it's like a jawbreaker, right, we're trying to gnaw on it to break it up, that's when you see fish kind of spinning it on their lips, spinning it back out, they're trying to go, how do I break a piece off? That's the number one sign that the food you fed is too large for their mouth structure. Um, a lot of live bears, you know, they, their mouth kind of opens up wide, but it's very long. And so smaller foods typically work better. And that's for almost any type of, of animal, really, like whether it's a dog, cat, fish, human. You know, we might be taking a big old bite out of something, but we need to make sure we can take it in bite size. Now... Given a choice, we'd probably all rather have the same exact flavor and taste and everything, but in bite-sized pieces. And that's what, you know, we do as humans, right? We go, oh, popcorn chicken, popcorn shrimp, like, you know, we break it down into smaller pieces. And we have the ability to do that with our fish food. On average, though, we get lazy. And what I mean by that is, ah, this will work. I bought it. Not quite the right size. So I'm just going to feed it, right? But... When you go back to re-up, get a better size or break that size down. I believe that, you know, very few fish or very few people would ever need, and the key word here is need, right? Very few people would ever need a pellet bigger than two millimeters. That's why I kind of limit what we offer um, to more than, to, you know, we don't offer much more than a two millimeter pellet and that's by design, most big fish can still, like I've got koi that are this big, right? They eat a two to three, well, they eat a three millimeter pellet. But I could just as easily, and I have, fed them two millimeter, millimeter pellets. They eat it all the same, right? So whether I eat one piece of popcorn that's this big, or I eat a handful of popcorn, it all goes in pretty much the same way, except I can choose to eat smaller pieces. And in an aquarium where we typically have mixed size mouths, right? If we have some small fish, we have some larger fish, the smaller food, the smaller diameter food kind of always wins out because, oh, now they can eat it. The bigger fish can eat three or four at a time. It works out, right? So the sizing is very important to me. And whether it's crunchy, whether it's hard, whether it's soft, whether it gets soft quickly, whether it's already hydrated, all these things matter. Now, I find that like bettas, they want to swallow stuff, they don't really want to chew stuff. So very small pellets, frozen foods work well. Um, they don't really like flake food. If For the most part, for a guy that feeds a lot of bettas, they, it's not that you'll never find one that would eat it, it's that on average, they don't want to take bites out of the flake. 
They're a grab it, swallow it type of fish. And so that's a very different part, different type of fish than say uh, these goldfish. These goldfish, they're not really designed in nature. Not that, not that a normal gold, fancy goldfish is designed in nature, but inherently they're meant to be like scavengers. They'll eat the tiniest little particles. They'll eat their own poop. They just keep eating and eating and eating and eating very small things. And that's where they, they get their digestion from. Just keep eating like a cow. Eat all day long, right? Where like a, a carnivore or a predator fish, they go and they get their one big meal and they try to let that sit and feed them for a long period of time. That's a different method of feeding. But in general, we'll keep these micro predators, you know, some of our fish in our community tanks are still predators. We'll keep our passive fish, we'll keep our betta, we'll keep all these things, which a betta would be like a micro predator, by the way. We'll keep all these things in the same aquarium and typically we'll feed them the same two or three foods. And that's where I think we run into a problem so my, my advice, I guess, is that we analyze mouth structure so that we watch the fish eat and we see how they're taking it. Two, you downsize the food. Now, if you're feeding just powdered food to goldfish like that, like that doesn't make sense either, right? Like that. But in general, a small pellet will make a lot more sense than a giant pellet, especially like some of like that goldfish is huge, that one not so huge. It doesn't make sense to only feed big pellets to these two and then make that guy try to break it down. The reality is we should be doing the opposite. Feed the small guy, oh, how do I do this? I don't know, I can't, I can't do the, the backwards camera thing, but feed the small guy, the big fish can always eat smaller food, but smaller fish can't always eat bigger food. And becomes very apparent when you're raising up baby fish. Maybe you got guppies, platies, swordtails, whatever it's going to be in there. Same thing. So like in my ponds outside, I pretty much only feed like our fry food. Now maybe once a week I'll put in frozen blood worms or something like that or frozen brine shrimp to like just beef up the parents. But I'm feeding the fry because if I feed the fry, they'll grow and the parents can usually eat that. So Expanding more on fish foods, uh, frozen foods, I believe, are the best food possible for the average market. Now, that's me being 100% truthful there because while I sell frozen foods, I only sell them in the retail store. So you watching this right now, most of you can't even buy frozen foods from me and you would go to your local retail store. That's fine. Frozen foods, they've got some benefits to them. In general, they're like a whole thing. So it's a whole blood worm, a whole brine shrimp, a whole... Uh, uh, my brain can't work, but Daphnia, Cyclops, I still can't think of the one I want. It's uh, the white shrimp, like mysis, there we go, like a whole mysis shrimp, all that. What I like about it is there's not any fillers, not extra ingredients, it kind of just, it is what it is. Two, in the cubes, that helps people feed and learn in moderation. Three, it stays in the freezer. So the food itself stays very fresh. You take it out, you put a cube in your tank, you put it back in the freezer. We're not opening a bag, taking a little bit out, feeding, closing the bag and setting it back down, re, re basically submitting it, submitting it, subjecting it to oxygen over and over and over again, right? So that inherently is gonna be, yes. Okay, let me make, let me make a good point here. So first, hit that like button if you want to hear this analogy, right? Or if you're at least, if you're, what are we? If you're 20 minutes into this, you might be enjoying it. Hit that like button. If you want to subscribe, go ahead and subscribe. Hear more crazy rantings. But here I have some smoked sockeye salmon jerky, right? Now, if I only ever open this bag, if I can do my job right, if I open this bag and I take a tiny little piece and I eat it and I close it up like that and I've left air in there, right? That is gonna dry this out and make it go bad faster. And if I do that every day, by the time you start getting down towards the end, it's gonna be radically different than when you started. With it being frozen, if this was all frozen up, right? 
and I take a piece out and this stays in the freezer, we don't have that going on because it would all be individually compartmentalized, right? That's a good thing. That's one of the best benefits of frozen foods. Now, anyone, you know, probably the chat's probably going wild, probably lots of things going on, right? But live foods usually are better than frozen foods, but I don't believe that uh, most people will do justice to live foods. So what I mean by that is if you have two or three aquariums, it's hard to make enough live food. It's hard to make a, a variety of live food, and you can't rely solely on it, right? So you can't just be like, I'm the live food master, and then it got too hot and half my cultures died, or any variations like that. Now, you should totally go and set up a Home Depot bucket in your backyard with some tap water in it, and let mosquitoes lay eggs in there, and then, uh, you know, then net them out and feed your fish. You should be doing that because that's one, fun, and two, satisfying to feed, and three, it is a live food. Like, those are all good things, but it's really hard to sustain your hobby on that, so this is why we're talking about frozen and dry foods. So I do believe that frozen are the best foods possible for the average hobbyist, assuming you can afford it, and that's the other thing I think about is that it can get very expensive. I feel like a lot of people don't feed their fish enough. So there's definitely like in at the beginning of the hobby, we're so afraid of overfeeding fish that we dial it back. We dial it back. We dial it back. Right. And everyone's saying, don't feed very much. You know, overfed leads to dead. Right. There's all these little slogans. Uh, that are in the hobby for this type of stuff, okay? But then we get to a point where maybe we're breeding some fish, and we've got a few fish tanks, and everything's going okay. But the reality is, instead of feeding once a day at a decent amount, we should be feeding three or four times a day. And it's not that we need to feed four times a day with 20 pellets, but maybe we should be feeding five or six pellets four times a day, right? spread it out and allow it's easier on filtration it's going to be easier on the stomachs of the fish uh, it's going to be easier or better nutrient uptake for that fish it also is going to make it so we interact with our aquarium maybe four times a day and it allows us to see who's eating who's not because when you just throw in a like say 20 pellets and you kind of like walk away if everyone takes one pellet you assume everyone ate well, what if, you know, Fatty McGee right there ate 16 of the pellets and everyone else got one, right? So you got to kind of keep a better eye on it when you're going, okay, here's six. Okay, everyone got one. Cool. And then four hours later, here's six more. Everyone got one. You know, you'll be more in tune with what your fish tank is actually consuming. And it gives you the chance to vary it up quite a few times. Each one of those feedings could be a different feeding. Uh, like in Dean's Fish Room, as an example... It's live brine shrimp in the morning and at night, and during the day, it's different types of foods if he's got time. So he'll feed anywhere from two to four times a day, depending if he's got to go to work or it's a day off, that type of thing. And that's kind of how I do it as well. I've got, so I'm, I would say I'm abnormal, but in general, people collect fish foods because we're always searching for what's the next best food. And the reality is once we learn that all fish foods for the most part, are relatively equal, then we can kind of stop with the collectoritis and we can focus on how does it feed? Is it a different size? Am I getting a tangible benefit? Not a slogan on a can or a better feeling or something like that, but do I see a difference? And that's the, the big thing that a lot of these fish foods just don't do. They, they make a lot of claims, but is it actually different and better or is it just say it is, you know? And so that's what I try and focus on. And the reality is there's only so many ways you can feed fish. There's only so many ingredients. And after that, you know, so let's say you've got flake food, pellets, crumbles, frozen, freeze dried, and like a rapashi powder type food. I'm trying to think if there's any other, like an O-nip tab. Yeah, that's you. You basically got about seven modes 
So there's only seven variations there. And then you get down to like, okay, we could vary the protein source. We've got fish meal. Maybe we have pea meal. Maybe we have krill meal. Maybe we have uh, soldier fly larva. Maybe we have uh, saltwater fish instead of freshwater fish. Uh, maybe we have black worms. Maybe we have blood worms. Like you can get maybe 10 different protein sources. So you get about 70 different combinations or whatever. No, well, it's way more than 70 actually, but you get all these combinations. But then like, is there actually a huge difference between krill flake and pea powder flake or black soldier uh, fly larva flake? And there, I don't think there is a huge difference. I think krill's going to enhance some red, but I'm not convinced that a well-balanced soldier fly flake is going to be like horrible compared to a krill flake in a red fish, right? So I think if I was doing my job correctly and I was feeding a fish, let's say a guppy, it would be, it's getting some flake food, it's getting some nano pellets, it's getting uh, some rapashi, it's getting some frozen cyclops, it's getting some live baby brine shrimp, it's getting uh, something with algae in it just to uh, maybe bring out some more colors, like all of this in the span of a week. And some of that is naturally going to happen in your aquarium anyway. Like if you have some algae growing, you're going to have that algae for them to graze on. If you have algae, you probably have uh, little crustaceans for them to graze on, right? And so you get this big picture going, and I just don't I've, – I've yet to ever see – a monumental difference when someone goes, my fish look way better now that I feed this food. I just, I, I don't see it. Like even on, I call BS on the Hikari. Well, let me grab it. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I think I have it over here. I want to show you. All right, I'm back. So I call BS on the day one and the day 30 on this package. They're, sh they're showing a red phantom tetra here that you know basically looks like doesn't have much color and then has color, right? Any breeder knows if you're raising a fish, you can, I could definitely point out which 30 days are gonna bring the color, right? Like with goldfish, with guppies, all this stuff. So you could just take the right fish and then like feed it anything and then be like, wow, look, that food made it better. That's what I don't agree with is, and you could take a fish that was horribly nutritionally neglected and then feed it really good food and then maybe you could make that comparison also. But I don't believe that, like, I don't think you could take this fish, let's say this fish was three years old all of a sudden, which it wouldn't have been for this picture, but let's say it was three years old and it was eating Hikari uh, like micro, micro pellets. And now you feed it Vibra bug bites. All of a sudden you wouldn't see this color shift, right? So yeah, I, I honestly don't believe that there's huge differences. Now, everyone will debate there are differences, and I'm not saying there's not, but whether I think the difference is, like, if I'm going to eat a salad tonight instead of four Snickers candy bars, I don't think so much the type of lettuce I choose, which iceberg's going to be way worse than spinach and that kind of stuff, right? But I think a well-balanced salad with right proteins, right veggies, and all that kind of stuff versus just eating four Snickers no matter how much, how I really make that salad, now I know there's someone going there, yeah, but people put way too much dressing and all this, and it's going to be unhealthy. Like, I get it. But for the most part, that's just a better decision. And I think that's how food goes in an aquarium. Better educated decisions. So, like, I, my favorite thing about this food is the delivery method, the slow sinking. Now, people say, like, my guppies don't eat it. Well, that's because this is way too big a food for guppies. You either A, got to crush this up, or B, 
you have to let it sit on the bottom. When it gets really soft, then they'll eat it, right? So that's another thing is like, are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? And that's what I, you know, so like this, on this package that's in front of me, this is, okay, so by the way, this is one of the few foods that I was ever semi-interested in before, like, I went to Hikari instead of Hikari coming to me. Because I was like, hmm, the actual worm-like shape, there might be something to that. Because fish do really love bloodworms. That's a true thing. Like, that, I was like, okay, I could see how maybe that would be crazy good. Now, when I originally fed it, I was just like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, I mean, we'll sell some, I guess, right? And it was fine. Like, Discus did take it right away, which is cool, because I was like, yeah, blood worms, that makes sense, okay. But for the most part, it was just a food, and, you know, it's got fish meal, krill meal, and then it's got wheat flour and flaked corn and cuttlefish meal and all of this other stuff in there. And I'm just like, yeah, it's a fish food, whatever, right? But it was when the finicky fish would, would take it, like uh, bushfish, Datnoids, both of those, which are typically finicky feeders in my own fish room, ate it. Uh, we had puffers eating it and all that kind of stuff. And it's not that every single fish every time would take it, but compare that with a random other pellet and it's 0% zero times ever, right? So that's a big difference. Um, yeah, so that's that's it excited me because I felt like possibly the shape of the food here added maybe an eighth element, right? Like, okay, it's not flake, it's not a normal pellet, it's not this. Like, the stick form always existed, but sticks in general were always things that just sunk like a rock and were too big. Like, they were, I think they were extruded out of things that make um, pasta, not so much extruded for fish food, right? And this is a much thinner... So I, and we even, so the breeders and I, we even noticed differences in the bug bites. So naturally, we, we think, in our own brains at least, we, in a bigger package, the, the what are, bites, I guess, the bites are more whole. In the smaller package, we feel like maybe they get crunched up a little bit more, but let me see if I can get one of these on camera here. Oh, I don't know if that'll, will it go that small? Maybe. But they're very small. They're smaller than actual bloodworms, and I like that. I like that they're smaller than bloodworms. You know, but still, these are still too big for guppies and stuff to eat right away. Like, their mouth is just not ready to take something that big. And that's why I'm not a huge fan of straight up just bloodworms for guppies. Only the biggest guppies can really take those bloodworms. So, I'm going to feed these little water cows behind me real quick. So yes, I'm going to dive into some questions, and we're not done talking about fish food, but I also think that some of the people that have been asking could probably steer me in a direction. So thank you for all the new members that are joining up. If you're considering being a member, you get some perks, you get like uh, some emojis, you get a channel icon, you get some members only content, which was kind of the day in the life from Sunday, and then... I'm trying to even get anything else, really. You don't really get anything else. You just get to kind of get a little bit more insider access. But I am trying to prove a point to YouTube, and so I have another meeting with them on Friday. So if you're on the fence, tip it, tip it towards signing up right before Friday. Even if you, you get rid of it after Friday, that's fine, too. But um, So, yeah. All right. Let me... Oh, my, my Viber bites are blocking my screen. Let's see, how many cardinals can I put in a planted 75-gallon tank? Asked Cody. Uh, in ours, so I haven't done with cardinals, but I did with neons. I did 700. So usually your wallet will give out before you'll buy 700 cardinals. Big Texas tank. USB air pumps got me through a three-day power outage with minimal loss. Love the product. Keep up the good work. 
Uh, hope you can make it back to Michigan soon. So to spin that into fish food, by the way, if you ever have a power outage or do a huge tank maintenance or some disrupting event, like when I caught all the fish out and I moved them and all that stuff, don't feed. And so talking about food, fish in general, let me think here. I think every fish can go basically at least 30 days without eating. I'm trying to think if I can think of one that really can't do that. Besides absolute tiny baby fry, like baby, baby, three-day-old fry can't do that. But let's, let's talk about anything that's probably 60 days old or more. Now, this isn't optimal, but I'm just saying if usually you're in a uh, – you're in a situation where things aren't optimal. Like, why wouldn't you be feeding? Maybe you have ammonia, maybe you're moving. You know, like, there's already something not optimal. So this is, like, the path of least resistance or the best choice to make. Um, but not feeding. It's, it's almost as important as feeding, right? So if we don't feed, typically bodies get a little weaker, right? Fish start losing weight. Their immune systems won't be as robust, but if we do feed too much, we throw all that out the window and now we're like, yeah, you had a crazy good immune system and you were really fat while I killed you with ammonia burn, right? So it's, it's easier just to cut food off and weather a storm, especially like he did there. And I would highly recommend cutting food off for, you know, if you're on a vacation for a week, unless you have super aggressive predators, you don't even have to feed. Now, if you're dropping fry in there, those fry are going to get eaten, that kind of stuff. But, you know, when I'm gone for a week, I have someone stop in and feed basically twice a week. And mostly, it's not so much do I want them to feed, which I do, but it's mostly do you see any illness? Do you see anything going wrong in the fish room? Just check in, give me peace of mind, and then when I get back, they'll do just fine. Because I've fed them really well before I go. I'll feed them really well when I get back. And so think of it like, you know, if you put them through the Christmas season with lots of extra cookies and they put on all this winter fat and then you know you're going to be gone for a couple times a week for the next two or three months, at the end of that, if they were getting, you know, fasting a little bit through the week there a couple of times, they're just getting back to their trim weight. So I don't fear not feeding fish uh, outside of extremes. And I think a lot of people do. A lot of people go, my fish doesn't look good. I bet I, 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 should, I should feed it more. I should get her new food. I should. And in general, that's, I think, the opposite advice we want to give out. You know, when I don't feel well, I don't want to eat at all, right? You know, when you're really sick, if you got the flu and you're puking and someone has to force you to eat some rice, some bananas, some toast, like you don't want to eat. So usually it's better just to hold that back. All right. Ginger with a $10 super chat. Thank you for the super chats, by the way. I appreciate everyone. Derpy goldfish. Your gold goldfish tank from way back is why I keep derpy goldfish. It's a bonus that yours troll you. Glad to see them back. Yes. Uh, you know, with everyone watching, thousands of people watching these goldfish, and every, invariably someone's always concerned that thing's doing a thing. Whereas the owner might go, like, yeah, that, that thing does that thing. That's what that thing does, you know. Hey, your dog's doing a funny thing. Like, yeah, he does that. Same thing with goldfish. Hey, your goldfish is doing a thing. Like, yeah, I know, he does that. He or she does that. So, but I, I enjoy them. Uh, I'll tell you. So I don't know 100% if I'm going to disclose the vendor because they haven't done anything wrong to me. To me, I guess. They, they've done business worse than I would do it, but I ordered some goldfish. I ordered, I think my total, I ordered three goldfish, and I think with shipping was about $550. Some goldfish that I liked for here, and there was a problem with FedEx, and they had, like, called the shipper, and the shipper didn't answer the phone, and apparently one of my fish died. Now, they refunded all the money, and they reshipped it, right? But I, I feel like the whole transaction was exactly why... We stopped doing goldfish. It was very callous. It was kind of like, hey, one of your fish died. We're reshipping. Do you want to pick out a new one or do you want your money back? And I just was like, how, who, who responds well to that email? 
Like, I was like, I guess let's take my money back. Like, you're... The part of it is, like, you already lost some of my confidence. Like, you killed one. You didn't even get it here yet. You killed it. Two, we were waiting around all day for those goldfish to come in. And guess what? They never notified me until I emailed them. I was like, hey, uh, these goldfish were overnighted. It's now that next night. They're not here. What happened? Oh, I'm sorry. They're dead. I'm like, oh, good, right? So, you know, because I don't, what I don't want to have happen is I, they've, they've done... Like, I'm not out any money or anything, so I'm like, okay with that. We'll see how they come in and all that. I don't want to hurt their business, but at the same time, I definitely don't want to prop them up be like, these are amazing, buy it from them. So, yeah, just had that going on. I don't even know how I got on that topic, but new goldfish are on the way. D more derps. I did import some derps, too. So, alrighty. Buckwheat. I've got a 40 or 75-gallon tank. And he's got some balloon mollies with 12 fry. What other fish work well with them? So in a 75-gallon tank, if that if you only have those mollies in there, that thing is huge. If you got other fish already, um, hmm, let me do some brain thinking on that. I personally, if you're going to want some hard water fish, I don't know, I love mollies. So I'm like, ah, I don't want to lose those babies. You know, I'm assuming you don't want to lose those babies either. So I'd probably go with maybe some Corydoras, something down low at the bottom. And then long term, I might go with uh, like some Dwarf Neon Rainbows. But I'd let those fry raise up. Get, an, get the colony of uh, mollies you want first. So that way you don't like lose out on those babies. So, All right. The Fishy Mailman. What's up, Fishy Mailman? The only thing I've seen in my own experience that I've seen color up fish is Vitachem soaked food. Uh, we're going to have some rants today. So Vitachem is a uh, vitamin soak. And I ha myself haven't seen, I haven't seen it color fish up more. I have seen it take a fish that's been horribly neglected and make it healthy. You know, if we get something in from the wholesaler or... Someone abandons a fish and it comes into us like an Oscar with a horrible hole in the head and all this kind of stuff by super loading whatever food we're feeding with a lot of uh, with a lot of vitamins definitely helps. But I also I'm also not sure that if I just fed a lot of good food and did a lot of water changes, it wouldn't get better already anyway. I just in my mind I'm always like, let's just really make it better for this fish. And so I don't even give it the chance. Like I've never done – that. that would be a great study though. I might do that. If someone ever brings in like two Oscars or something and they're both like in poorly bad condition, like they have sunken in bellies, they might have a hole in the head, maybe give one – like feed the same food every day but give one food soaked in Vitachem and one not and have it be auto water change and do the same thing over and over and over again and see if I can tell a difference. Like did we increase uh, – recoup time or did we you know did we get tangible benefits or was it just like yeah it's just it was the same you know took it from a bad spot to a good spot now it's doing better I, I i love doing that stuff firsthand because i feel like when people do like the pepsi challenge most people are biased and i would say myself included like if all of a sudden I worked out a deal where they're like, Vibrabytes, man, you're going to make like 50 bucks per package you sell, it's in my best interest to make sure Vibrabytes don't look terrible in a video, right? And I feel like most people that do did that with New Life Spectrum and all that, they were already like New Life Spectrum fanboys, most of them. Not all of them, most of them. So they're trying to justify their own decision. So it's like if I was, you know, if I bought a Mercedes... And I was trying to defend why Mercedes were a good buy. Like, already I'm biased towards, like, I need to justify my purchase. So I like to redo those experiments for myself and go, did I see an actual difference? Or, you know, for me, mostly, the difference I can see, like, oh, that food feeds cleaner. Good. Great. That's good. I can, I can live with that. But the actual fish being different, there's so many factors in pH and temperature and the amount of times you feed and things like that that most people don't most people myself included 
don't run very technical experiments because it's too hard to isolate different factors. So even if you compared it all summer long, you know, like maybe the temperature is hotter and so the fish just look better because they ate more and the metabolism is higher. Perform the same thing in winter, all of a sudden you don't get those effects because water temperature is naturally lower and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it's, it's really, I find it really hard to quantify something more than my opinion. That's why I'm always like, check it out. This is my opinion, not facts. Because I can poke a hole in almost any fact of like, well, did you account for that? Well, no. Oh, it shouldn't matter? Shouldn't matter or doesn't matter? Hmm? Right? So, all right. Caleb has been battling. You know what? I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to him on Friday on YouTube why does the super chat thing not have whether they're a member or not? Because I was feeling like, I think Caleb Holt might be a member, right? I was just thinking that, and I was like, I should know that. It should tell me right here. Like, it should pop up. So I'm going to tell him, hey, make it do that. Anyway, I was going to answer it either way. My brain was just sidetracked. Uh, I've been letting the algae in my Mabuna tank grow. So far, it's only brown. How do I get green algae... Like your tanks, I dose easy green. One of the best ways is to get some seed algae. And what I mean by that is find someone that's got some green algae. Back in the day, like at the uh, the cichlid shop we ran, we used to sell algae all the time. Like, oh, you want this rock covered in this algae? All right, put it in there. And it, it's really easy to propagate once you have it going. Uh, the problem with algae is once you get one algae really thriving, it's hard to turn the tide. You almost have to kill that one and let another one take over. So... Shop around at your local fish store, and when you find some, go, hey, I know this sounds insane. What would it take to get that algae off you? Like, I need that piece of wood, or I need this thing. I, I really, and, you know, kind of explain it like, I want, um, you know, I want it so that my maboon are going to feed on it. I want an advanced setup. It's not like I'm just some crazy dude that wants algae. Like, they'll go, oh, okay, yeah, let me see what I can do for you. And that's the way we've always been able to supply it. Otherwise, it's kind of random. You know, set up 30 tanks, one of them will get green, and then maybe that's when you go, okay, I'll put that, you know, I can propagate that if I want. I've been seeing lately on Facebook, there's been some really cool, like, green hair algae bottom tanks, and then, like, statues with green hair on it look really cool. Uh, I'm a fan of it. I always like, oh, I should do that. All right. Got lots of new members. Well, not lots, but new members, which is good. Just bought a nano uh, diety stone pack and loving it. Diety stone. Nano diety. Must be, must have autocorrected from Seru stone or dragon stone. But yes, glad to hear you're enjoying it. Uh, Corey, your helpful staff gave me good advice about my puffer. Good. Glad you gave us five bucks. That pays, that helps pay for pizza Fridays, right? What are good options for adding vegetation and fiber to the diets of a five-year-old fatty and 13-year-old common goldfish healthy but seeing impaired? Yes, so that's, that's a good point to bring up about fish food. So like a lot of us, we focus on fish meal, krill meal, and then we start going, hey, it's got wheat and flaked corn and brewer dried yeast. I don't want those in my thing. Like you do need fiber and things to help it pass through. So the things I look for, roughage. So algaes work really well. Shells work really well. Like one of the best ones is frozen brine shrimp. Those shells and everything, a lot of fiber help keep that fish moving. Uh, live or frozen daphnia. What I like about live daphnia in a tank with like just sponge filters, they can live in there until they're eaten, which is great. Um, you know, you can do things like peas, but I find them messy and cumbersome. I'm not, not a huge fan of the peas because labor intensive for how many tanks I have. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else, like a little bit of flake food and stuff. Like flake food inherently, they end up taking in little bits. Like it's a messy food to feed, but what else, especially like spirulina flake, they won't love the taste, but it can help them moving right along duckweed if you can get a duckweed farm going that's one of the best any any uh plant like that would be a great you know a great thing to do there i've got a whole video actually on goldfish foods 
uh, in the Wayback Machine, like me and Lamont, or Lamont and I did it probably three or four years ago. But it actually covered really good, in my opinion, what to feed goldfish to keep them moving regular. All right. Uh, Avery says, my new mollies are water cowing down on tons of hair algae. How much should I feed them and what should I feed? Uh, so I think you're the one that, yeah, you had, no, maybe not. I'm trying to think if you had the tank with, nope, it was someone else. I personally would feed them uh, some protein food. Maybe it's frozen bloodworms, maybe it's frozen brine shrimp, maybe it's vibrobites, maybe it's north fin, maybe... I would, I would pick something where I'm like, hey, this thing is protein. I'll feed them that, right? If, because they're getting a lot, they're getting a little bit of protein, a lot of veggie type stuff from the algae. So I would focus on what can I give them that will supplement that a little bit and, you know, pick, pick a food off the shelf. I don't think you're going to see huge gains one over the other. So pick one, you know, maybe a little flake food. If you're, if you're, if you got some babies going, maybe you do flake or a micro pellet, you know, fry food, something like that. That's what I would add to it. Cause a lot of times that micro foods will get stuck on the algae and they're just eating that algae anyway. That's how they feed in the wild. So yeah. New members stacking up Albert, uh, Jinko, Jinto box and think tanks. Well, thank you. Adding to the, the squad. Squat. Dwayne says, I feed my fish bug bites, micro pellets, tropical flakes, dried brine shrimp, dried blood worms. What is a good food to give them vegetables? So let me think. I'm trying to think of the fish that would normally eat all that. And then I'm trying to think of the vegetable part. Uh, I personally am a huge fan of green beans out of the can. So not all fish will eat it, but a lot will. It just takes like one green bean in a tank. You can eat the rest. You can feed them to a turtle or whatever. Um, so that's one source of vegetable I like to do because it stays water stable for a good day or two. Uh, other than that, I personally, what do I do? I, I really like, this is going to sound insane. You guys will see it coming up in my fish room videos. But get yourself like, I mean, I have it over there, but. Get yourself uh, like cichlid Excel, like or or just any veggie pellet that's like you know a two millimeter pellet that floats. So let it float around your tank. You'll watch your fish just pick at it all day long, kind of like it's like an apple. They'll just keep taking layers off it. Um, but you know, most foods. I wonder if this food has algae in it. Most foods have spirulina in it because. Because consumers know, like, oh, that's a good thing for fish. I heard about that. So I wonder if this one... I actually don't see it yet, but I bet you somewhere I'm going to see it. Because it's too... It might actually... No, right. Hydrogenized vegetable sucrose polyesters. Yeah, that's probably what they're using. But this thing has... So one of the things... This, this food... Uh, just from my own research, it has crushed silkworm pupae in it. That will put an insane amount of fat and size on your fish. It's The studies have actually been done if you feed only that, like in koi and that kind of stuff, they get fatty livers and they die. So in moderation, perfectly fine. But don't go to town on silkworm pupae because too potent, too much of a good thing. Um, but yeah, I would think... Roughly anything that shows some green on the package will work for you. They don't, like, what was the last studies I was reading? It was something that, like, fish can only utilize up to 12% spirulina. So things like Zoomed Spirulina 20 just has excess spirulina they can't even utilize. Um, whether or not that study is true or not, but, again, well-rounded diet. That's what's important. All right, I know there was some questions up. I'm going to go back towards the beginning. Um, I think someone was at, okay, well, I'll just answer this one because it catches my eye. What do I think about New Life Spectrum Hex Shield food? I feed it to my goldfish once or twice a week. It stinks to high heaven, but they really go for it. What I don't necessarily like about that is I believe Hex Shield has 
some medicines in. Let me look. Uh, new life spectrum hex shield. Let me see if I can find ingredient list here. Because I know you can't feed it uh, for more than like seven days or something like that. You have to take a break for sure. Because it product details. Let me see if it'll say what's in it. Uh, it's got krill. It's got Algae, it's got both spirulina and uh, chlorella algae. It's got seaweed also. Hmm. It does not say, so it just says life saving medicated fish food. It's not telling me what med is in it though. So I have, I have had some success deworming fish with it. Uh, back when we used to sell it before New Life Spectrum and us went to war. Um, but my without delay, derailing the entire show and figuring out what the med is, my worry would be feeding low dosages, and I say low because you're only feeding it twice a week, of a med, I would want to know what med is it, and then is there any studies that show if I... S submit this fish to that thing twice a week for the next 10 years, does that do anything to their kidneys or liver, right? We know in humans, different meds prolong can have effects for a very long time. So that's only my, that's my like, my hesitation with that because it actually has meds in it. It's, it's way different if you're like, I did it when I got them and every time I get a new fish, I use that as part of my quarantine routine. And so maybe that's like three times a year, but twice a week, it could be micro dose of something that adds up like, you know, I fear that the reason you can only feed two times a week is because it builds up in their system. I don't know what it builds up to if you're doing it every week. Like, does it get stored? Like there's different medications for humans and stuff that get stored in your fatty tissues and take a very long time to come out and that kind of stuff. So that's my hesitation. And your question was, uh, what do I think about it? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a very good treatment for helping deworm stuff and quarantine. I wouldn't use it as like a, a daily driver type food for every week type of deal. So, yeah. Uh, Mike's wondering if I run into tuberculosis. I have. The signs are usually lesions and tumors on the body. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no known cure. So, quarantine... And they can live very long lives still. It is communicable, so it can spread on nets and you can move fish around, that kind of stuff. But in general, I don't know of a cure for it. So, yeah. A few months ago, I asked what live food for my fish, and due to my specific fish, you suggested scuds. Would it be difficult to raise them in a Fluval Spec 5? Uh, no, scuds are a very easy, they're kind of opportunistic, will eat on anything. Uh, you couldn't raise them in a tank with the fish, the fish will just eat them. And you might have to run a sponge filter because you might find that your little pump on the, in the back compartment of that fluval spec will just kind of churn up those scuds. Like if they go in the impeller, like zing, they come out as confetti. Uh, so that's not good, but... I would give it a test, though, because they might be like, oh, they just passed right through. No problem. Like in a saltwater system, brine shrimp usually will just go right through the impeller and into the display tank. Not a problem, really. So, yeah. All right. Make sure I got that one. Someone was asking earlier, like, where does the $5 go when you become a member? Uh, it goes straight into my pocket after YouTube takes a cut and then taxes take a cut. And then I reinvest that into uh, the business, essentially, is what happened. It doesn't actually go to my pocket because everything goes through YouTube, or everything YouTube goes through the business and the company and everything. So it doesn't actually go to my pocket. But, you know, as a metaphor, it goes to my pocket. Like, and one of the things, you know, like you could, the problem with money is you could take it any way. Like, I could, I could sit here and be like, because of the members, I now do this for my employees. Or, you could also say, because of the members, I now carry this product, which makes me make more money. Like, money going into a bank account and then getting spent, you can't really be like, oh, no, that one was spent for this and not, you know. So, like, when we gave a $200 gift certificate 
to a teacher who emailed us this week, I could be like, give you the warm and fuzzies and be like, because you guys were members, we gave $200 to a school in need. The reality is, because we're doing okay at business, we're able to make that decision. Now, does membership help that? Yes. Does people watching videos help that? Yes. Does people buying stuff help that? Yes. Does employees being great help that? Yes. There's so many factors that go in. I can't really tell you specifically where your money will go other than we try to put it the best places we think possible overall for our business. And uh, so, yeah, we did add a new we did add a new perk for employees this week. Uh, and that is now every employee gets a one hundred dollar shoe credit from I think the place is like Shoes for Cruise is who I chose. We'll basically buy a hundred dollars worth of shoes for every employee every year just to make sure that uh, they have good good shoes on their feet. They're not getting hurt and uh, make it easier because they work in a warehouse. They work on their feet at the store all day long. And that was a, another thing we could add. Like I was like, that makes sense. We should do that. So now I think all of our so – we have 15 right now? I don't know. We have two new people – uh, starting their test days, one tomorrow and one Friday. So, but yes, all all employees now get a hundred dollar shoe credit every year, and that's kind of what your money does. Is we just keep making things more awesome, whether it's more awesome for the employee, whether it's more awesome for the consumer, whether it's more awesome for a guy in India that can't buy from us or really support other than watching it any other way. Like it just goes back into we're gonna do more things. You know, I would I would say. Worry about your, where your money's going when it's like, Corey doesn't do YouTube anymore. I don't hear about them helping the hobby anymore, blah, blah, blah. Like maybe then it's like he's just extracting all this money to build uh, – I don't know what I'd build, but, you know, something. All right. Matt Hoffman became a member. Welcome aboard. Pizza Fridays, yes. That's what you should do. Like your $5 – goes towards whatever you think is awesome. If you think Pizza Friday is awesome, if you think us paying 100% healthcare for employees is awesome, if you think Corey wearing red shirts is awesome, whatever, you know, in your mind justifies it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what you get out of. Like sometimes I just feel good about donating money to something cuz I'm like, yeah, I'm helping. I'm part of that. I don't need, you know, I personally don't need to know what part am I helping. I just need to know, ah, I'm doing a good thing. It makes me feel good. That's also my side rant that I don't know that I don't know that donating to charity is truly a selfless act unless no one could know you did it. I I think about that a lot of like if someone knows I donated a thousand dollars, then because them knowing that I donated a thousand dollars that makes me feel good, it's no longer selfless, right? So it'd have to be like Here's a thousand dollars. It could get donated to one of these thousand charities, and no one will ever know, and I'll never know which one. Maybe that would be truly selfless donating or something. But I have a weird mind that thinks about that kind of stuff. The fish bar. Really like the way you treat your employees. Money for the fun. Well, thank you very much. I'll probably see you at some conventions, which maybe your money's going towards conventions, right? Because we got to fly out there, and we've got some new some new things in the works. Hopefully, they'll be ready. By the time we're at the convention, we can hand them out for free. So, all right. $15 minimum wage. We actually do uh, the minimum at uh, our store for full-time employees. Minimum $17. So, yeah, it's it's lots a lot more articles are coming out lately. The one the headline I read, I didn't read the article, but the headline I read yesterday was uh, basically Seattle, which we aren't in Seattle proper, but it's still expensive around second highest like uh apartment and housing costs only second to san francisco so it's like that inherently makes you know keeping employees a bit harder so yeah all right daniel Hartman says oh no as a chef for 20 years shoes for cruise does not make great shoes well there's like 700 different brands to choose from on there like i personally you know, so my big thing was I wanted to make sure that there were shoes available for everyone's foot type. So one, do they feel comfortable working in it? Two, is it a style they like? You know, it's it's very, you know, I've worked for employers that had uh, credits before and they would be like, yeah, you can only get this boot. And you'd be like, this boot sucks. 
yeah, well, go buy your own then. You can have this boot. And so I chose them because they had a selection, you know, from let's say, you know, New Balance and Skechers and like, you know, a bunch, a wide variety of brands. Um, so I could satisfy the most while keeping it easy and manageable and not like a nightmare. So, yeah. All right. What am I falling behind with? David Gilkinson with a $10 super chat. Thank you very much. You haven't found a bug yet this week. David Gilkinson is like the master at finding bugs on our website, which we have a lot of them because we continually update. So tomorrow, well, I, I've got a new developer. Well, I've got a new update that the developers have finished. I have to proof it and I have to do some testing and I, I can only test on so many devices. And then we got to roll that out. But I don't think I'll roll it out tomorrow because we're moving the warehouse and that is its own nightmare. I don't need like there's a problem on the website and we're having problems with the warehouse move at the same time. Which speaking of which, for all of you guys ordering right now, let's say our goal is to ship as much as we can before noon Pacific Standard Time tomorrow, which hopefully we'll ship everything. And then move the warehouse and resume shipping Friday morning. If there's some kind of weird snafu in there, there may be you know, I'm going to say up to a 24 hour delay, which would be very not normal for us. We ship very quickly normally. Uh, but because we're moving to the new warehouse, which someday you guys, uh, I'll put a video out about that or something like in general, warehousey stuff like doesn't do that well. You kind of go, Oh yeah, it's a warehouse. Cool. What about fish? Um, but we did, we did uh, lease a building that's 10 times bigger than our current building uh, for the warehouse. And we've got conveyor belts and, doodads and gadgets and you know we were able to up the safety factor even another notch for the employees and we expanded our plant holding capacity and there's all those things and there's been a little bit about it um, kind of pictures and a video or two on the, the members section but in general normal YouTube goes yeah warehouse we don't care because you know 40% at least well 45% of everyone can't buy from us so they don't care. They're like, yeah, it's a warehouse. We don't care. Like, we can't buy from you anyway. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Carolyn Epler says, like, I needed another reason to love your business model. Shoes for crews is awesome. So, yes, proving my point tenfold. I, I talk about this in manager meetings all the time. No matter what move you ever make, there will be people who love it and people who hate it. And my goal is always... If we believe that more people will like it than hate it, we're doing the right thing. And uh, whether it's YouTube, whether it's shoe choices, whether it's you know anything in business, if the majority of people think it'll be good and it's a positive change, a goldfish is really derping out right now, uh, then we will do it. And hope if it's obviously terrible, we'll revert back. But for the most part, it guides us pretty well. All right. Con Wallens. Also glad to hear you're taking care of your employees. They've been great every time I've gone into the store. Yes. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to hire on another retail store employee because the retail store has gotten very busy. It's getting hard for people to take vacations. And uh, it's not that they can't. It's that when one of the crew is gone because we run a tight ship on the retail side, uh, it makes it hard day for the couple other people working so if we can add another person to that rotation allows that little breathing room so that people don't have to feel like they're inconveniencing their fellow employees hmm this one says let's talk about Corey's not the red shirted species they keep coming into my store and many, except bronzes, die within a day and have large hemorrhaging or red bruise-like things. Uh, I would focus on, when I see that, as either A, they're really not being taken care of at the wholesaler, which happens quite a bit. Two, they're notorious for bacterial infections. and They can die very quick from it. And a lot of times when they're in the net, like if you're at a wholesaler, and what happens a lot of times, okay, this, this company wants 24 of them. They grab a big net full. And in the net, they're now using their pectorals to stab each other, right? 
And they're creating all these wounds. They're infected. If they go deep, right? If they go deep, now we can get internal bleeding and everything, right? So then they're going to pick out 24 of them, put them in a bag, ship them to you. Now there might be some ammonia in the water. There's not nearly as, as much oxygen availability as there was. They're stressed out. You get them. And I find that antibiotics are the best way to start staving that off. But if that doesn't work for you, I would start testing other vendors. Also, it never hurts to ask the vendor what's going wrong. So you can kind of come to be like, yeah, you know, the corridors I'm getting from you guys, they're not doing so well. Like, can you show me a picture of what your guys look like? Like, where am I going wrong here? And if they won't do that, or it's a little like, yeah, ours didn't do so well either, you kind of know what's going on. But if, you know, if, especially if you went and visited and you're like, let's say you bought 24 Panda Corridoras and next week you go and visit them and their Panda Corridoras look amazing, buy 24, but have them ship them to you or deliver them like they normally would. And then know, do they, is it the shipping process that's doing it? Was it... These ones look good, and now they still look good, so the last ones were a bad batch. Like, a lot of it is detective work, and we have to do that all the time. I mean, there's, back in the day, there was wholesalers who would travel eight-plus hours to go visit, and then still have them shipping to us just so we could see, is what I saw what arrived at the store, and can I expect that time after time, and where do I think they're going wrong, blah, blah, blah. And because if you don't have a feedback loop in business... Like, if, if everyone just assumes the corridors are dying because they land at your store and they're not doing well, maybe they don't know they have a problem. And sometimes they do know they have a problem and they don't care. In which case, then now you have new information to find a different vendor who does care. Right? So that's a tough one, but I would, I would definitely... Erythromycin, maricin slash erythromycin, definitely a very important one in corridors from my experience. So... All right. A couple super chats from DH and Russell Mullis. Thank you very much. And Rockland became a memberino. Well, thank you. I'm going to keep answering questions. A friend of mine has betas that regularly get down to 68 degrees. Come on, get down. Uh, what are my thoughts? The internet says 78 to 80, and the fish look healthy. For me... I'm always the guy, if it looks healthy, it probably is, you know. So, like, who am I to judge someone that's out in their yard weeding and looks super healthy and enjoying their own, you know, front yard, and then I watch them, like, pound six quarter pounders with cheese from McDonald's. Like, who am I to judge whether that's healthy or not? Like, maybe their lifestyle is... They're doing so much that they need all that, and it works out just great. Same thing with the betta. Like, I still believe fish handle one stress factor just fine, so maybe it's a little cooler than it likes, but has great water quality otherwise, great food, super interactive owner, like, and it just works. Now, if you were to tell me water 68 degrees, looks like it's got a bacterial infection setting in because it sits at the bottom all the time, should I say something? I'd be like, yeah, maybe. Maybe ask some questions. Maybe not tell them what's wrong, but ask them like, hey, that better. A lot of times he's doing, you know, he's up and about and doing things. He's not really doing that. What's up? You know? But I, what I know is, and I would say breeders talk about this a lot. Somehow... On the internet, there's only one way to do something, whether it's breed discus, whether it's breed angels, whether it's breed rams, whether it's breed anything, whether it's water changing, whatever, right? And yet, I can travel the world and see it being done at massive scales directly opposite of the way people say it can be done. It can only be done this way. Fly over here. It can only be done this way. You both make the same amount of the same fish. Like, clearly, it can't only be done that way. And the reality is... We as humans, when we find success, we assume that's the way to do it. But the reality is, you know, if you can find, you know, it's like a pitcher. Every once in a while in b baseball, you'll get a pitcher that can pitch differently than other people. 
and it's very effective because it is different. Well, that's because it's not the norm, right? And same thing, just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. There is a lot of bad things out there, but we shouldn't assume, we should observe and go, hey, I think we should, you know, in fish and probably in life in general, if we approach every situation of what can I learn from this as opposed to what can I teach about this? Like most of my knowledge has come from what can I learn? And it doesn't matter. I could go into a five-year-old. I mean, okay, this is a good example. So I, I talked to, um, there's a family locally to me in the club that has a fish room and very accomplished breeders. I believe both parents are doctors. They have lots of intelligence and they have like a 10 year old kid. They have a fully automated fish room and all that. And they can breed cardinal tetras. They can breed cichlids. They can, you know, they're those types of people. It's, it's like having, having a Dean, like Dean, go breed these. And then like three weeks later, he's like, yeah, so what do you want me to do with the fry? Right? So they're very talented. But with their, I learned a bunch from their their son actually, and their son, um, they won't let him set up on the auto water change because they want him to learn about the fish and breed his own fish and do all that. And he has been doing that, which is great. And what he does is he takes a pitcher full of water, like he goes and gets it from the sink. I don't even think he dechlorinates it. He gets a pitcher of water and he dumps it into his tank. They do have it so the water will overflow, so he can just dump that water in and it overflows, right? And that's how he keeps his tank going. And that's, you know, it taught me that, like, it doesn't take a whole lot. It takes just, yeah, once a week, you pour in a pitcher of water into that 10 or 20 gallon tank. And that's enough to refresh and take out enough pollutants and really keep the fish breeding. And so, but my main point is approach everything with what can I learn from this, not so much what can I teach. Now, in those instances, it is a good idea if someone asks you a question to reciprocate. If we're all only trying to learn, you get two people that are trying to learn from each other in the room and neither one will talk to each other, that doesn't work, right? But in general, even when I go to, a, let's say, a, a fish farm or a wholesaler, I'm like, this is a train wreck. I switch my brain to, what am I going to learn from this train wreck? Like, wow, look at the abuse that fish can take and still be healthy. Good to know. You know, but then maybe three years later, I come back to that same thing. Like what I thought was fish abuse was actually brilliant. Like maybe at the very beginning of my hobby, oh my God, there's algae everywhere. How dare these people? And now my hobby would be like, ooh, natural method. These fish are going to be real healthy, real easy to bring into my ecosystem. They're going to thrive for me. This is exactly what I want, right? So perspective changes. But I think that mental shift and what can I learn from the situation, you know, so... In, in regards to that beta, like, what can I learn here? Like, okay, the betas are doing okay, or at least that beta's doing okay at 68. What is allowing that to happen here? Like, what, what are the good things that are going on that isn't making this unstable? So, yeah. All right. What are my thoughts on CHA products? Have I ever used any of the hang on back or the cancer filters? Uh, I don't think I've ever used a hang on back. I have used our cancer filters. We used to sell them. And so the, the filter itself is fine. Like it's a box that you were going to want it through. It's fine. But their customer support was terrible. So they were not selling very well United States wide. Okay. So what was happening is the O-ring, you know, kind of you put the head with the motor down on the body and there's an O-ring there that keeps from leaking. Well, from the warehouse, they were coming dried out. And so people would buy one brand new off my shelf, and it would be leaking. So then I would get another one out of another one and give it to them. And usually I would fix the problem. But it was near impossible for me to get reimbursed or buy extra O-rings. And usually that's the sign to me that I don't want to work with a company. When they make it impossible for me to do the right thing, like... Wait, so if I hadn't torn another $200 canister filter apart to give them this $5 part, they would have just returned it and been angry. Okay, and you're not willing to, like, it's not that they're not willing, but they're like, oh yeah, go to this website and order these O-rings. So first I was like, wait, shouldn't you be giving me O-rings because they're not right the first time? Two, 
you're like sold out of half of the sizes. So that didn't make sense either. So it never worked out. Like I wanted to like their products, you know, but it just, CJ to me, I think they focused on saltwater too long. And who'd they pair up with now? High door? Did they pair up with High door? They paired up with someone. And so now I'm hesitant about that product. I'm like, ah, you know, the, the good news is CJ did have their pumps and everything made in Italy, just like Eheim. So the stuff when it worked was really quality. The problem was their customer service wasn't quality. And I believe, let me Google that. I believe so much so, there's been a radical shift. Uh, is it, let's see, CJ, uh, president leaves company maybe? I think the president of CJ separated ways. I can't pull it up, but I remember reading about it the other, the other, um, the other day, so yeah. So I don't, I don't know, but I believe he left the company. All right. Ooh, Twin City Guppies with a $20 super chat. Whoa. You got to sell some guppies to be giving that $20 away. Gummy Bear Fund or donuts for the crew. Is meant, oh wait, whichever they prefer. They probably prefer gummy bears. Like the gluten-free option, that kind of stuff. Uh, they were awesome when we were there. There's still a bunch of room uh, to type a bunch of stuff, and I don't know what to say, so stay awesome and guppies. Well, good. I'm glad that most people uh, are having a good time when they visit the shop. Someone left a comment earlier, and I was too busy to even follow up on today, but they said somewhere on the Internet someone is saying that uh, like our retail store is abusing fish, like we leave bags of fish to die on the floor, and like... So either A, it's some crazy isolated incident where someone one time saw us set down fish and then like help a customer and then go put them away, or B, someone's completely making stuff up because one, like fish safety aside, I would never allow that because that means I would be losing money. Like that just would never be allowed. And two, all of our employees actually care about fish. So, you know, it would it would have to be like, some crazy corner case. So mentally I go, someone's got to be trying to, to stir up trouble about the aquarium co-op because I just, I can't view a scenario where that's actually happening. Like, you know, I just, the employees care so much that, you know, and we, we film the unboxings for crying out loud. So or not all of them, but, you know, it's just like we're, like if there was going to be a company to abuse animals, it's not the aquarium co-op because we're on film like all the time. Like even when I'm not filming, every single day someone's in the store shooting for Instagram or their own Facebook or the aquarium group support. Like we essentially like have to operate like we're always on camera. So I just can't fathom a situation where we're like, nah, just leave them in the corner to die. Like I just can't imagine that. So yeah, but I will follow up with it and be like, who, who's saying this? Because that seems crazy. And then if I get to talk to him, be like, what did you see? And then I'll go back to our, our cameras. Because we have cameras everywhere in the store and that kind of stuff. And I'll be like, did that actually happen? Hey. And most times what would happen is like, I'd probably talk to an employee if this thing even went down. And they'd be like, oh, yeah. Dean brought in a bunch of fish. We took them out of the cooler. We set them down outside the tanks. Then we had like 20 customers. We got all them taken care of. Then we put the fish away. And I'd be like, yeah, that's how you do that. You know, but if someone saw it, like they just let them sit on the floor. It's like, well, we're letting it acclimate to the temperature. We got them in front of the tanks where they're going to go. Blah, blah, blah. Like standard routine. So, yeah. Have I seen the black worm box from Jack Watley Discus? It's a lifesaver for me because I have a bunch of wild discus. Very finicky. Yes. When I was... Uh, when I was there, he had just gotten the prototypes, and so his logo wasn't on it yet. I think his he's got them now. Uh, but yes, in my personal opinion, I still think it's too expensive for a piece of plastic. Like I think, and I don't know what they, I don't know what the retail was, but I think the price I heard was like thirty dollars, and I was like, uh, it's plastic and mesh. Like hey, right? But if they've come down quite a bit, then good, you know. But I just inherently I was like, dang, this is like this is like a fancy Tupperware container we're talking about here. Whew. 
Like, I feel like above the $20 mark, it's like, dang, I, I don't know if I could buy that. Like, I would make one. And you can make them, too. That's the thing, is you can make them out of, like, get yourself a Tupperware, and then go buy, like, the metal filter uh, for, like, a coffee maker. That works all the same. Like, I've used them to clean 30 pounds of blackworms before. They work. And it's, you know, at a certain point, you know, there's that whole, like, I can make this, and it's actually better than the one I can buy. Um... Yeah, but no, that product in general uh, is is a good product. I've used them. Black California Blackworms used to make a version. Theirs was hard plastic, though. I wasn't a fan of that as much. Uh, this one was more of a, a softer plastic, which I thought was better. So, uh, Yana says, hey, tried uploading my Fluval 3.0 in the app, and now it won't turn on or connect. I tried emailing Fluval with no response. Any ideas on how to reach them? So... Here is the 100% transparency between Aquarium Co-op and our fans. There, I don't know what the exact number is, and I have not been able to identify the bug on which causing this, but yes, updating some Fluval lights is causing them to break. So we got the app upgrade that everyone wanted, but something in that process for some people bricks their light. Now... If you bought the light from us, what we are currently doing is we are uh, replacing it and then telling Fluval they have to replace it. Now, that's obviously a savage beating for us because that means we're shipping you another light that costs us another $27. But at the same time, I feel like it's our duty to make it right. And we have two different contacts that we're working with at Fluval. I say working with. We've emailed, and we've gotten gotten limited response. In fact, I'm going to check the response right now. Ah, there is literally a response that came in at 5 p.m. exactly. I would show you this screen, but it would show you my email and then other emails that don't want to be shared, but I might be able to read it to you. It says, Randy and Corey. So Randy, my right-hand man, right? Uh, here is some additional information on the app. We have been able to address basically every issue that has come up so far with a few exceptions. If your customers are having uh, an issue, please advise them to contest, contact us directly at fluballaquatics.com slash US slash contact us form. I'm just going to copy and paste that into the chat. So that's where we're at so far in this email. Then... Uh, it says, FYI, we do have an app update coming out tomorrow, which will help several of the issues. Okay. Uh, and then they've got a little bit more info. Let's see here. It says, about the app, requires BLE 4.0 and above to control Fluval Bluetooth LEDs. I'm guessing that is Bluetooth something 4.0. Some, someone that knows Bluetooth way more than I will uh, be able to, I'll check chat. I'm sure someone in chat right now is telling me what that is. Uh, the next thing says requires Android 4.3 or iOS 8.0 or above. Good to know, right? Uh, it's only affects the Fluval Aqua Sky, the Fluval Plant, the Fluval Nano, the Marine Spectrum, and the Marine Nano, okay? Uh, the features are the manual, manual, auto, and pro mode, independent color channel and customization. Yep, we knew about that. Multiple preset lighting configurations. Yes. Dynamic effects. Oh, the dynamic effects are only for the Aqua Sky version. We know that. Thunderstorm mode. Uh, and then it says what's new. And this, by the way, this is the thing I hate the most. The password. Uh, password functionality. Maybe there was like husband wife teams were at war with who's setting the color thing but it's annoying for me to put in a password uh but password functionality the sleep time period is new the pro mode is new apparently there's an faq and troubleshooting support in there and an instruction manual in the app so what do i get from that email that has come in as of five o'clock today and by the way we started this conversation six days ago july 25th the day of the app the minute we got word that some people are having problems, we started our inquiry. Um, but, yes. So basically what we learned is, new app coming tomorrow. Maybe don't 
flat. So what happens is the new app requires to use the new functionality, a new firmware update. And for those that aren't nerds, basically, the software that lives on the light, we have to update that so that it knows how to do these new features. And somewhere in there, there is a bug. So hopefully the new version that comes out tomorrow will take that bug away. And I have no idea if a light that is already having a problem, so this person said it was Yana, so maybe wait for the app to update tomorrow, try again. If it's still not good, if you bought it from us, we'll take care of you. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So that's the 100% transparency. I'm glad there's at least an update. Um, so yeah. All right, back to questions then. Yeah. So local fish guy said, mine just said factory password of 000000. Yes, they're all that. But when you have a ton of lights, so like on this tank, to change the lighting, I have to enter that password four times to update all four lights, right? And so you can imagine if you got a lot of lights, a lot of passwords. So, yeah. Ah, BTLE is Bluetooth Low Energy excuse me, energy. Now I know what that means. Hopefully I'll remember that forever on. Yeah. Uh, and Yana says, that's the form I used. I emailed twice so far. I'll email, but wait for the app to update to see if that hopefully solves the issue. So yes, this is one of my main complaints with any company. So I think most of you guys know when you email us, we get back to you as quick as we can. Now, we are probably an exception to the rule in that we are wicked fast at getting back to people for the most part. But I, so in my mind, I feel like if you're a giant corporation, Fluval slash Hagen, you'd have a system in place that if you did not have enough employees to respond within, let's call it 48 hours, that you could set up your system so that it would say, we've received your inquiry we are running at a three-day lead time currently. Expect a response in 72 hours or whatever that response time is going to be. Uh, when we've been overwhelmed in the past, we've set up things like that, like we've got it. Let, we're just letting you know we've got a ton of people asking questions right now. We will get back to you as soon as we can, and we follow up on it. So, you know, part of what, I, what I'm not a fan of also is a lot of these companies that have been around for, let's say, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they're too used to doing business Monday through Friday only. And not only that, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The way the world works now is we're a 24-hour-a-day, seven days a week economy. And so what happens is, you know, you, you, you have a problem, you email them, ah, oh, you miss the cutoff because you're on the West Coast and they're on the East Coast. The next day is a Friday. People are leaving early because they're like, hey, it's good Friday. You know, I got to got to see my kid play a basketball game. So now that person misses that half of a Friday. They don't work Saturday. They don't work Sunday. Now here it is Monday. They've got four billion emails stacked up and they don't even get to you till Wednesday. Meanwhile, you submit it on a Thursday and you're going, it's been six days. Haven't heard a peep. I'm going to send another email. Because that's what you do, right? Like, maybe I failed. Like, maybe me as a consumer, maybe I failed here. So you send the next email, which I would have done the same thing, Yana. And then, so you're like, you put another email into the queue, right? So that queue's bloating from not being timely. And that's what I know. When I look at the, the analytics we have, if we don't answer quickly, in general, people will send multiple emails. So now we're churning through three or four times as many emails because it's kind of one of those... If you do it quick, save yourself residual emails. You take a bunch of time to do it. Now you're going, wait, did I answer this one? Didn't I answer this one? Ooh, I don't know. So, yeah. Ooh. I hear that Ray said the Totem Smokehouse left something special for you at the shop. I will enjoy that, and I appreciate that, Ray. What happened to the huge clown loaches? Uh, they are in the 125 gallon in the fish room. So yeah. So Yana says you're completely right. I emailed again after a week in case my first one got lost. 
That's exactly right. You're the you're the perfect consumer. You waited a whole week. You didn't get a response, and they could have done anything to say, "Oh, we're just running behind, Yana. I'm very sorry. We have a lot of inquiries right now. Looks like we'll get to you tomorrow or whatever." And that would would you know? Here's what I'm always disappointed. At. Like at this point, you're asking me, and I I'm not even a part of Flu or Hagen, but I'm like, I tell them like, why do people come to me? When your website had a problem, why do people come to me? And it's because like you guys are so bad at communication with your consumers that the burden is put into your dealers, right? And uh, like a dealer should never have to know like well, I don't know why the why the Fluval website is not up for a week. I don't know, right? So yeah. James says, you would think big corporations would work like that, but unfortunately, less is more staff-wise. Being in the procurement world, I would have to deal with some of these kind of companies. Joy wrong. I, I fully get the monetary gains by not answering questions short-term. Long-term, you're only hurting yourself, though. Like, And we just live in a society currently that lives by the quarter, People get hired and fired based on quarterly projections. Did you make goals? Didn't you? If we were living in a, a corporate society that was, you have a five-year plan, did you enact that five-year plan or didn't you? Stuff like this would be very important on the spectrum. Like, ah, don't answer those questions. We don't have that money, blah, blah, blah. If we make our target in 90 days, I get paid. Yeah, that's the metric we use. Or not we, but a lot of companies are using, so... Yeah. Uh, Yana says, I was hoping you'd have a direct way to contact them. I re really appreciate answering. So, yes, I do. I, I, can, I can email the VP and all that kind of stuff. What happens when we do that, by the way, and that email had lots of people in Fluval in on it that I read you guys, is a lot of times the people don't know the answer. They're going to ask the next person. They're going to ask the next person. And so, like, let's say we start our inquiry on July 25th, which was true. We say, people are having problems. What's the fix and what should we do? They can't come back to us with an answer because they got to get a hold of the developer and go, hey, what's going on? How, when can we get a fix going? You know, assuming the fix is needed. They got to do internal testing. They got to do these things, right? So, but a lot of times, you know, they, the person you ask doesn't know the answer. Like, let's say my local rep. My local rep doesn't know the answer because he doesn't know the person that talks directly to the developer that will say, the fix is coming next week. So there's delay there. And, you know, what goes on sometimes is companies just go, just don't answer those until we know the resolution. Right? So, yeah. So while we do have direct lines in, um, th those lines don't always have the correct answer. Or not, not the correct answer, but an answer that makes any sense currently. So, yeah. I mean, we were on the phone with Fluball today. And stuff like that. And, you know, it's kind of one of those, like, we're looking into it. Yep, we'll get an answer as soon as we can. So, yeah. Do I think the Aqua Clear still beats out the title, Hang On Back? 100% yes. I still believe, like, all I can say is if I was buying a Hang On Back tomorrow, every time I would buy an Aqua Clear over a title. Yes. The title, it just got things that I don't like the surface skimmer action. I don't like the shape of the basket. You know, it's got things I don't like. It's got things I do like. I don't like it's, it's more expensive typically, you know. But if I was buying one tomorrow, I personally, and this, whenever I say if I was going to buy one, I'm saying as a hobbyist, if I was to walk into someone else's store and pay full retail, I would buy an AquaClear. Like obviously if I, I mean I sell Seachem and I sell AquaClear, but if I got a better deal for AquaClears, I would never give you the advice of you should buy AquaClears because I got a better deal. I'm talking... We compare retail price to retail price. What would I buy? I would buy the AquaClear myself. So, crushed coral for snails? Definitely, I would. I would use crushed coral. Helps buffer the pH so they don't dissolve the shell. Yes. All right. Uh, just tested my water. My GH is 300, my KH is 40, my pH is 7.2. Can I add guppies or crushed coral for higher pH? Uh, those water parameters look stable enough for guppies. You could definitely do them. If you want to add some crushed coral, 
that would work as well. Why am I all out of focus all of a sudden? What's going on here? Wait, it's like... There we go. That was weird. Anyway. Um... I have Guppy that keeps swimming into the opening of my filter. Uh, is he safe in there? I mean, if he can come and go as he please, probably all right. But yeah, I mean, if you can lower the water level a little bit, you don't want it so much that the water's falling in because then that creates evaporation. But you could also put like a, a sponge pad right at the front. So, you know, you got like the spillway that goes on. The water's coming through here. He's probably going up through there. If you put a pad right there and it sticks up, you won't be able to get in. You could try that. So, do a Pleco breeding video, Corey. I think I have two or three already. At this point, there's 800 videos. They're just not easy to find unless you're searching for them. So, yeah. Pre filter will save your guppy? Well, from going through the intake, yes. Definitely. Um, we answered that one. Yeah. All right. Well, we hit the end of the Super Chats. Got a lot of new members. How many new members we get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 19, 19, at least one more has got to become a member, right? That makes an even 20. Yeah, got to get a, got to get that number up. The, I don't know, they won't tell me what it'll do. Like, I just keep asking my rep, I'm like, is it more impressive? And they're like, yes. He's like, the better you do with that, you'll come up on reports. There's more likely that you can have access to other people and ask more questions and, you know, I don't know if that'll do anything, but the more I learn about YouTube, like this kind of this, the more I can learn about YouTube, the better videos I can make. And that's what analytics are for, by the way. When I see how long you guys are watching, what you guys like to watch, all that, it allows me to go, okay, so of the 330,000 people that are watching, or whatever, what do they like the most? How do I make my content more like that? Because it doesn't make sense for me, like, if I just have my fish room, right, and I'm doing stuff for me, well, given if I was doing it just for me, I wouldn't even film it. I would just derp around, do whatever I want to do. But if I'm now going, okay, do what I like to do, but also make it interesting for people, then I want to go, well, what are people finding interesting? Oh, they find this interesting, they find that, they don't like that, they do like this. So the more data I can get, the more I can tailor what I'm trying to do. You know, So it's like if I'm making you guys a pizza and you guys hate pineapple, but you love salami... Okay, well then let me make more salami on the pizza, right? So that's what we're trying to do with the analytics. And the higher echelons you get, you get these people that will help look at analytics for you and go, hey, did you notice this trend? Did you notice this? And not trend as in like, you know, Aquarium Co-op's doing a fidget spinner, but trend in that like, people love your live stream. So we found out, uh, ooh, Cody Green, thanks for becoming a member. Number 20, number 20. Uh, we found out that whether it was members or not, so we can we can separate what do members watch, what do non-members watch. Both of them primarily watch live streams. So like of the best performing videos, live streams. Part of that is because YouTube prefers longer content now, but they prefer longer content because we as the viewers now prefer longer content. We don't want to have to watch as many videos. We want to set a video on our TV, go do something, listen to it, that kind of stuff. And so, but I always assumed until of like two weeks ago, I had always assumed that the live streams were great for people that have subscribed, but not great for people that didn't subscribe. But turns out it's good for both. And so that's where I got reinvigorated. You guys have seen like, wow, he's making his live streams, you know, every week again, because before I'm just like, ah, you know, I don't feel like doing it, blah, blah, blah. But knowing that both groups of people like it, more motivation. So, David Martin, I have a Mubu puffer that likes to eat green beans that I feed the Pleco. Should, 
Should you use another food that the puffer will not like to eat? I don't know. I feel like I would just keep feeding. Maybe with the light out or maybe feed more. Eventually that puffer is going to get full. But I think I would be stoked if my, my Mabu puffers would eat green beans. That would that'd be awesome. I want that. So, what is your favorite food for Corey's? Corey? My favorite food for Corey's. What am I really big on right now? I end up biasing so hard to try to not sound like I'm pushing something. The reality is. The food that I'm feeding a lot of to the corridors that I like in my fish room right now is frozen bloodworms and vibrobites. I mean, they get other stuff too, but I, if, I, if I'm going, ooh, I want to get them some good food, I lean towards these two. Like, I'm just too late. I'm too busy. Not even lazy. I'm too busy right now to make rapashi food for them. So I really love rapashi food, but I'm just too busy. And, yeah. But, I don't know. I guess... I need, I, need, I need to look into that, like, I'm almost willing to self-sabotage just so I don't look like I'm pitching you the product. Like, I, I get that 50% of the internet hates bug bites, but I'm on the 50% that loves them. So, naturally, I'm going to, if I, I'm actually feeding them. That's why I have, I take home bags and feed them because I like them and not, yeah. I mean, this is, so, to be honest, this is one of the foods... I basically go, is, the, is this food I'm testing better than this? Do I, do I reach for it more often? Do I like it more? And most times, it's like, the answer is no. Like, oh. So that's like one of my standard foods I really like at the moment. So. Ben Ochar with a $5 super chat. Thank you, Ben. By the way, Ben has his own channel. It's been going for quite a while now. He did his first live stream. I think it was on Saturday. So, Yeah. Oh, Richard says we need nine more members for this video. He's on to something. Is Ben a member yet? I, I can't see. Dang it, can't see on the on the uh, the old super chat. Thanks for making all those videos. You or they've really helped me when I was making mistakes and also the point of quitting the hobby. My question is, what kinds of goldfish are in the tank behind me? So behind me, that guy. That is a black ranchu. This one up here, that is a black moor. And then I've got uh, a calico ranchu, which, come on, come on the screen. Where are you? That's that calico one right there. That's a butterfly tail. It's got a big old, kind of opens up like a butterfly. And then... These two, oh, well, why, why can I do this? This is a red cap aranda and a chocolate aranda. Aranda's kind of got the big brain on them. Uh, I'm going to have quite a, not quite a variety, but I'm definitely going to beef up how many goldfish are in there because I'm, I'm really enjoying them because they're just, they're super low maintenance. They love to eat. They love to derp around. Uh, definitely I'm going to beef up some of the plants and the decor and that kind of stuff. Um... Yeah. So yeah, Easy Aquatic says it would be neat if we could gift memberships like you can a subscription on Twitch. So I am, I am part of the beta team feedback, so I can mention things like that. I can say, you know, give the ability to gift it, and they might implement that. So, yeah. Uh, well, now that we're talking derpy goldfish, I tell you what, what, what was the fancy, the blue fancy goldfish from Black and the, the blue one? I think I had what was called a blue aranda. I mean, they're mostly bronzy. The blue is very subtle, but everyone seems to remember the, um, the, uh, uh, long fin veil tailed Ryukin calico. Yeah, that was the one that people remember. Have I been in communication with Jenny? I assume you mean Jenny of Solid Gold. I haven't. Uh, I haven't communicated with her in probably a year or two. She's kind of just doing her own thing. And uh, yeah, so I haven't 
no communication, unfortunately. I just had to take a root tab out of a guppy's mouth. Is that bad? Inherently, I feel like it's bad, but I think it'll be fine. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be feeding root tabs. <laughs> so, uh, any Ryukins or Tamasabas in the future? We brought some tamas Tamasabas in the store. Uh, the Ryukins, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to get a really good looking Ryukin. In general, Ryukins, their bodies are kind of bigger. I find them to be a little bit more aggressive, and I'm trying to keep it like chill town in there. So I, I'm on the lookout for Ryukins with really big fins because that slows them down and makes them not as aggressive. Or like even if they're aggressive, they can't chase things down. So I'm trying to keep it low key in there. Like I don't want people, not people, but goldfish to be getting bullied in there and that kind of stuff. Cause I'll remove them. I want it to be, I don't want it to like every live stream, like, Oh, look back there. He's chasing it. Do something. Save it. Blah, blah, blah. I just want it to be like, Ooh, I'm enjoying those. So once we get done with the, uh, the warehouse move and all that, I can focus on, you know, taking out some of these reflections that are in there and yeah I've got some ideas we might do a background so it's not the black background so it will uh, stand out better like there's things I want to do but also Peru is on us like 10 days from now or maybe 11 days 11 days from now I'm in Peru so like that's scary for me to think about because we're moving a warehouse tomorrow and every day is one day closer to being in Peru I get back from Peru. Let me look at my calendar. My calendar looks, I'd show you my calendar with all these crazy dates, but that wouldn't be a good thing. So yeah, the 11th I go to Peru, I get back the 21st, the 26th, so five days later, I fly out to meet with a company in Florida. I'm there till the 28th, we fly back the 28th. Then I'm at home for the 29th and 30th. Actually, I, yes. Then Saturday, the 31st, so I'm home for two days. That third day, I fly out to Coast, which is a fish club in Florida, not Florida, California. So if you're in California and you're near Costa Mesa, I'm going to be there. Then uh, I'm back for almost two, like three weeks. But my wife is gone for a week. Then it's Aquashella. Then two weeks later, basically, it's uh, uh, Aquatic Experience. Then two weeks later, it's Vivarium if I buy the tickets. And then uh, two weeks later again, I'm in China. And then, like, I get back from China two days before Thanksgiving. So, again, not the best timing, but... And nothing planned for December yet. So it's it's got a busy... So somewhere, like, you're going, okay, you're back for two days, you're back for five days. The five days and the two days are basically, like, do business stuff, keep hold down the fort, do live streams, that kind of stuff. That Those two to three week spans, I can actually get some projects done. So what we're seeing is I probably won't be able to tackle, like, a background for this thing until probably basically September. So I'm already, that's that's the one thing I don't like about my business and YouTube and all that is that even when I want to do a thing, it's like, dang it, I'm five weeks out from doing that because I'm so busy. So, but yeah, Sky Sky Skyland back says, don't worry about the lighting, content, surpass technology, you know, technical issues. I 100% agree, but this is something I want to do as well. Like I think visually all, I like the way they look with the non-black background because like the black fish will pop out against like a brown background or something like that a little more. So it's, you know, most of the stuff I'm doing now I'm doing for me, you know, and if it's for me and for you guys, that's like a double win. So I really like, oh yeah, I gotta do that. But part of it is I need to reach out to companies and go, who will make me some custom panels? Cause almost no one makes a background 40 inches tall and I want it to be very thin. I don't want to take up a bunch of the tank. So I need to start writing some emails and, and that kind of stuff. And naturally that's going to take some time, but Hey, I've got five weeks, so I've got some time. I should start, start those emails when I can. But you know, right now we're at war with flu ball, getting the app fixed. You know, there's always, there's always something more pressing on the, on the, uh, the timeline for me. So 
planning to go to Aquashella, Chicago. Which day should I go? Uh, the they're the same each day except for the speakers. So uh, if you want to see me speak, I speak on Sunday. If you want to see like King of DIY and other speakers on Saturday, I mean, there's more than just me on Sunday, but like I think Chris Lukup is speaking on Saturday as well, the Shrimp King. So it depends on, but the actual event, the physical event will be the same both days other than the speakers. So pick what makes sense to you. Yeah. Uh, what food did I eat in Peru that I thought was weird but delicious? Hmm. Weird but was really good. What? Okay, so I think the thing that, because I brought it back, that's how much I liked it, was their mayonnaise? It's not like our mayonnaise where it's just like, how do I... Like our mayonnaise doesn't have a lot of flavor, I guess. Where their mayonnaise has like lemon and all these flavors in it. It's not like ranch or anything, but it's definitely... It's meant to be used like we would use ranch in America. Does that make sense? Like it's meant to be a dip, I guess, and not so much like just for putting in stuff. So that was... Because that was weird, like, on the table there's all this stuff, and then it was like, so that's like a, a pouch of mayonnaise, what's the deal with that? And then they're like, oh, try it, and I was like, wait a second, this is amazing, like, with the lemon and all that, it's like, alright, I can get out on that. In general, I like mayonnaise anyway, but definitely it seems superior to our mayonnaise. So I brought back, like, four or five of them, and, uh... I think we only use two. Like I have, I brought back way too many thinking I'll, I'm never coming back. So, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. KG Cichlid says, hit the like button. If you've made it all the way to this point in the video, hit that like button. Leave a comment. Let me know what foods you guys like. And then, you know, the best thing you can do is watch another video. So I know you just put in two hours, but if you're watching this after the fact, click on one of the links at the end, watch another video, that sends like the biggest signal to YouTube of like, wait, they just watched a bunch of Aquarium Co-op and now they're watching more? My God, it must be good, right? And then it's my final plea. If you're not a subscriber, if you made it through a two hour episode and you're not a subscriber, dink, hit that, hit that subscribe button. All it's gonna do is the algorithm's gonna show you some more stuff and what it does is gonna figure out what you like about us. If you like the live streams, it's only gonna show you the live streams. If you don't like the live streams, you like the short videos, it's gonna show you those. But once you create, hit the subscribe button, you're basically telling the algorithm, all right, I like it, but curate what I see. If you wanna see everything, then you have to actually turn that notification bell on, and that's like the, no, 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 I want it all. All the options, I want it all, right? So that's my spiel, I have to ask for it. There's a super chat left, and I'm gonna answer it. Oh, there's actually a couple. All right, hold on. Uh, what's up? In your opinion, what's the best fish food for dwarf neon rainbow fish? High veggie, more protein. Uh, me personally, the best food that I think you could feed would be frozen spirulina brine shrimp. You're getting veggie. You get good fiber, you get good protein, all in one package. That would be the best food, I think, for those. So there you go. <laughs> How do I tell the algorithm to bring back the daily dose? You'd have to tell YouTube to uh, make it easier to do better on YouTube without having to do as many. Yeah, the daily dose grind is... The problem is, if everyone doesn't watch every daily dose, the numbers just go through the floor, and then all of a sudden, no one's getting served a daily dose. So it's a weird, weird thing. So Chad says, I'm digging Dean's idea, a gigantic castle in the 800. I would. If there's some giant manufacturer out there that can do a giant castle, I kind of would love a giant castle. It's going to be so like iconic of like, here's an 8 foot by 3 foot by 3 foot castle. Like... Innately, that sounds awesome. Yeah, so if there's a way to make that happen, I'd like it. Uh, we answered that one. Yeah, I think... Uh, so everyone but me misses the daily dose, and it's because the daily dose is ridiculously hard. And what I mean by that is, we've watched a lot of fish YouTubers go daily, 
invariably the quality goes down by a ton because the editing's insane. It's hard to do a lot of fish stuff every day. Like you have to have a family, you have to have work or business. And so it's a very hard schedule to keep entertaining long term. Yes, you guys are the most engaged fans. You love it. I'm trying to do a little bit more of it behind the scenes. But if everyone's not collectively watching it, it fails on YouTube. And then YouTube starts punishing you because you're failing. So, and I, I myself used to do it. And I did not enjoy it. it, it I don't want to say I was depressed. But waking up every day going, okay, I'm going to shoot a video today. And then by half or three quarters of the day, you're knowing, like, this is going to be a terrible video. Like, the shots just aren't right. I, ooh, fish were supposed to come in. They got delayed. Now what am I going to do, right? Oh, I got to fly all the whole day? How do I make a video out of this? So I, in my mind, my plan is to make not daily doses, but behind-the-scenes videos. So, like, I think it would be fun to show you guys everything I did in Israel, for instance. Behind the scenes, like this is what we ate, this is what it's like riding in a car for eight hours, this was like seeing this and this and this. You'll get little snippets of these farms knowing that the full tour is coming out and all that. So I would say that's where I'm trying to go. Even, yeah, Jimmy says weekly dose is hard. Yeah, most people uh, don't realize that a lot of creators struggle to get one video out per week. We routinely do three plus and going to seven or even five, like full-on media companies struggle with that. That's the reality. So we're, we do what we can. So, yeah. Aiden Meredith, haven't seen you in a long time, buddy. Neon Tetra is your thing. Thanks for all the live streams. I didn't have money. Hey, no worries, buddy. Yeah. So, yeah, car for eight hours? Ew. Yeah, that's what it takes. So when you're in a car for eight hours go to a fish farm and back like the fish farm is the good part outside of that not so much so will I ever go to Japan to look at the koi farms yes I have a standing invite by koi.com the problem is the good koi buying is in October and November and typically in October and November are events like we've got aquatic experience and that kind of stuff so but I do plan to go one of these years like right now Past couple, the past year we did aquatic experience, we did China. This year we're doing aquatic experience, we're doing China again. But at some point, I will go to the koi farms, and uh, yeah, so there we go. All right, guys, it's 7:04. If you can believe it, it's 7:04, and I have another appointment at 7:15. Like, I legit have another appointment at 7:15. That's how crazy my life has gotten. But hey. Fit them in where I can, and, uh, you know, I should be free about 9 o'clock tonight. So thanks for hanging out. Thanks for all the new members. Uh, thanks for all the super chats. Thanks for liking and subscribing and hanging out. And I will see you, well, you'll get a video on Friday and another live stream on Wednesday. So nothing wrong with that. With that, I'm out. Wish me luck on the move tomorrow. Whew. It's going to be a hot one. Yikes.